All right, we are ready to go. Again, my name is Melissa Huffman, and I'm the Warning Coordination Meteorologist here at the National Weather Service Office in Corpus Christi. And I want to thank all of you for joining us on our second Weather Ready Wednesday webinar. So this is going to be a weekly series that we do at least through May 13th that features different weather topics or parts of weather that we see here in South Texas, just to make sure that weather stays on your mind and give you something to do each Wednesday morning. If you have any requests for topics or things you'd like to see covered, I'm going to give you my email address at the end of this webinar. And feel free to provide any kind of feedback if you have any questions. Um, hopefully, uh, everyone is still good with the audio, but if you notice anything, any kind of lags or issues uh, during the webinar, please just put it in the chat window. Again, that chat bubble is at the top of your screen if you are accessing us through the app or if you're accessing us um, through any kind of the internet browser. With that being said, let's go ahead and get started in talking about our forecast process. All right, so weather forecast and how to weather forecast is one of the most common questions that I get as a meteorologist. How do we actually put the weather forecast together? It can seem like kind of a mysterious process, but weather forecasts are actually the result of a complex process of collecting, analyzing, and communicating scientific data. So we actually have to look at lots of different parts of the atmosphere, and we'll talk about what the atmosphere is in a minute, but we have to look at, at lots of different things. It's almost like we're uh, investigators in trying to figure out what's happening now and what that means for what's going to happen in the future. Now, if you're not familiar with the National Weather Service, we have 122 offices across the United States, and we also cover territory too, like Guam and Puerto Rico. Uh, but we are responsible for providing weather forecast information, so watches, warnings, and what's going to happen day to day. And we work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year to provide this information. Now, the Corpus Christi office covers a good portion of South Texas. So if you're from South Texas, we go all the way up to Victoria. We cover Corpus Christi, and we go all the way out to Laredo and cover everywhere in between. So we do have a local office here. We're out at the Corpus Christi Airport, if you're curious on where we're located. And if you're joining us from somewhere around the country, um, you know, take a look and see if you can find the forecast office that covers your area. This is a look at our office at the Corpus Christi Airport, uh, but it, we're more than an office building. We actually have forecasters. Surprise, surprise, who are responsible for providing weather and forecast information. So here is actually an image I have overlaid from some of our forecasters during Hurricane Harvey. If you were on the Middle Texas coast, this is probably an event that you remember very, very well. Uh, but this is a look at some of our forecasters uh, during uh, the hurricane operations for Harvey. And this is a look at some of our forecasters um, from just a, a few months ago um, within the office. Um, and personal shout out, I am the woman in the black. So you have a look at what I, I look like. Um, but we have a really good group here in, uh, in the Corpus office. And then we also have um, our leader, our boss, uh, John Mess, who's the meteorologist in charge. And if you've been in South Texas for a while and familiar with um, the weather community, you may have even attended one of his Skywarn talks or one of his weather safety events. So we've got a lot of forecasters uh, within our office. We have 21 people on staff, and that includes meteorologists, electronics technicians, as well as administrative support staff working behind the scenes to provide that weather information for South Texas. But it's not just done in a vacuum. We actually coordinate with several different groups across the country. So if you've been keeping up with the forecast, you're probably aware that tomorrow is the day that we're looking at for the potential of strong to severe thunderstorms. And those forecasts are coordinated with the Storm Prediction Center, which is located in Norman, Oklahoma. And those forecasters also work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they're specifically focused on the potential for severe thunderstorm development. Now, 
living in Texas, you're probably no stranger to dealing with flooding, right? We've got several rivers across South Texas, including the Nueces, uh, which impact several residents in Corpus Christi. And we have a river forecast center called the West Gulf River Forecast Center, which is located in Fort Worth. And they're responsible for providing us with river forecast information. We're also about to head into hurricane season, right? June 1st to November 30th is the time of year where we're concerned about hurricanes here in South Texas. And so we work with the National Hurricane Center in Miami, Florida for that coordination for hurricane watches, warnings, and everything else that's related to tropical systems. We have one final center that we coordinate with on a regular basis, and that is located in College Park, Maryland. And that is the Weather Prediction Center. And so with the Weather Prediction Center, we do a lot of coordination when it comes to the potential for heavy rain here in South Texas. And then if we get one of those winters where things are really cold, we actually do coordinate with them on winter weather as well. So lots of different folks are working to provide that weather and forecast information for us here in South Texas, but how do we actually put that weather forecast together? Well, our starting point is by looking at the current state of the atmosphere, which is the layer of gases that surround our planet. And this is where all of our weather occurs. So we want to know what's happening now, because if we don't know what's happening now, it's really difficult to figure out what's happening in the future. So one of the, the first ways that we look at what's happening now uh, around our region is by using weather satellites. Now, these weather satellites are located anywhere from 500 to 22,000 miles above the Earth in space, and they provide us lots of really good information about what's happening. And we recently upgraded our weather satellites. We did a big upgrade in 2016, and it was almost like going from a black and white television to high definition color TV. And I'm going to show you some of the images that we get from those weather satellites. The image on the left here is Hurricane Harvey around landfall, and Hurricane Harvey was actually the first storm that we were able to use these new weather satellites with, uh, but we're able to get weather satellite information uh, as quickly as one minute um, updates. So that's a really big improvement. Uh, and then we can also get weather satellite information that's not fixed over a certain point like it is with this Hurricane Harvey image, uh, but we can actually have satellites that orbit the poles and can give us a lot of information over the oceans, which tend to be areas where we don't have quite as much information, and that's because people don't live over the ocean, right? Everyone lives on land. So it makes it um, difficult to really know what's going on in these areas where we just don't have people. So that's where weather satellites really come into play. Another thing that we use for weather information are weather balloons. So this is a look at a weather balloon that gets launched from a National Weather Service office twice a day, every day. So what we do is we blow up this big balloon, we tie a parachute to it, and then we also tie something called a radio sonde. And this is a, a small box that contains a lot of different weather instruments in it. It looks at temperature, it looks at moisture, and it looks at wind, and it captures this and many different levels above the ground. So it gives us a good idea of what's happening between the ground and the very top parts of the atmosphere. And did you know that weather balloons can actually go up over 100,000 feet above the ground? The balloon that you're looking at there is oftentimes the size of a small house and it reaches that high because the pressure in that part of the atmosphere is so low. And eventually the balloon just gets so big that it pops. And so that's what uh, in the, the balloon observation is when the balloon pops. Um, but then we do that twice a day. And we actually launch from the Corpus Christi office here to provide some of that information over South Texas. Now, this is just a snapshot of what that weather balloon covers. If this looks like a big wiggly mess, that's totally okay. It takes a long time to actually learn how to, to read one of these, but this is called a sending. And again, this is just a snapshot. And so um, you're looking basically all the way from the ground to the upper portions of the atmosphere. So the ground's at the bottom of that image, 
and then the upper portions of the atmosphere are at the top of the image, but it's just a snapshot of what that radio sound or that weather instrument was actually able to capture. Now, as we keep going forward, we also have a really big network of weather radars, and this is probably the weather information that you're the most used to seeing because it's what we see on TV when there's storms in the area, right? So we have a ton of radars across Texas, including one here in Corpus Christi. And what this does is this gives us an idea, again, of where storms are located. And this is really important because some of this information does get used in figuring out what's going to happen in the future. How does weather radar work? This is just a really simple view of it. Radar basically sends out a pulse of energy hit something, and it could be a raindrop, it could be a building, it could be a bird, um, and then some of that energy actually bounces back towards the radar. And however much energy bounces back gives the radar of how much stuff is in a certain location. And so this is an example of a radar image, and you probably have seen this on your favorite weather app, on the Corpus Christi webpage, on the news. Uh, there's lots of different ways to display this radar information, but this is also something that meteorologists use to figure out what's happening now. This is a look at the Corpus Christi weather radar. We actually did have an upgrade here to improve our equipment a few weeks ago. And if you've never seen a radar, it basically looks like a giant golf ball sitting on top of a tee. So that the golf ball portion of the radar is known as a radome. And what you're watching here is the golf ball being lifted up so that we can do work to the inner portions of the radar. And this is actually something where it's not common to have these, these golf balls lifted up. Um, so it was a pretty exciting thing for us to get to see. But those upgrades have been completed. Our radar is working now, and it's ready to handle the storms that we have the forecast um, Thursday into the upcoming weekend. We also use surface weather stations, and this is probably something you've seen if you've ever flown out of a big airport before. So there's one at the Corpus Christi Airport, or if you're joining us from somewhere else, um, all of the big airports have them, and they capture a lot of the same information that you get when you launch a weather balloon. You're looking at temperature, you're looking at uh, moisture. Um, okay, I have Sarah saying that her audio is gone. Is Audio gone for anyone else? Okay, I'll keep going forward unless someone mentions um, any kind of issues with their audio. Um, okay, well, thank you, Martin, for, for chiming in on that. Um, okay, excellent, good deal. So, what these surface weather stations do is they capture a lot of the same things that the weather balloons capture, but they capture it at the ground. So we've got radar helping close to the ground. We've got these surface weather stations close to the ground. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you, viewer 11. Um, they also collect rainfall information. So if you've ever seen um, a report that comes out from us that has a listing of rainfall amounts, uh, some of these weather station observations are included in there. Now, we use lots of different uh, sources for those rainfall amounts. So some of you may be cooperative weather observers, and that's really helpful. Um, okay, potential network issues, that's good to know. Um, if, if there are any issues, we are recording this, and this will be available. We're going to put together a web page for it. So if you do miss anything, uh, just email me and, and we can work through it after the webinar. So moving on from the surface weather stations, which gives us an idea of what's going on at the ground, let's go ahead and try to put all of this together. So taking a step back from talking about weather for a minute, I want you to think about the last time you played a tic-tac-toe game. The whole point of this game, right, is to connect uh, a certain or O, whatever you're playing with, um, into a line to win, right? And you probably played this on a flat piece of paper. Well, weather forecasting is like playing a game of tic-tac-toe. You're trying to connect certain things 
together in a way that makes sense. But the atmosphere isn't flat. So it's almost like you're playing three-dimensional tic-tac-toe because you have to be concerned about how many different levels can affect levels above and below it. So you're not just looking at one level. You're not just looking at one tic-tac-toe game. You're looking at several. You're looking at games that go across, up, down, side to side, diagonally. You have to um, be looking at many different parts of the atmosphere to figure out what's going to happen with the weather. So let's put everything together. Since we've talked about um, things we use to figure out what's happening now at many different levels within the atmosphere. So way high up, we have weather satellites. Um, and I, I feel like I have to point this out, this is not to scale, these are not actual sizes, um, but it's just to give you an idea of where everything is in relation to each other. So weather satellite way high up, um, remember that 500 to 22,000 miles above um, the Earth's surface in space. Closer to the ground, we have our weather radar, our golf ball. And then even closer to the ground, we have our weather stations. So weather stations, radar, give us a pretty good idea of what's happening closer to the ground, but you can see we kind of have that really big gap between the weather satellite and the ground, right? That's where our weather balloon comes into play. So to give you an idea of some of the data that meteorologists look at at the ground, this is a surface map from this morning across the United States. And so this is something that our meteorologists are looking at right now to figure out what's going to happen this afternoon tonight, tomorrow, because again, your starting point when you're putting together a forecast is what's happening now. So let's say we launched our weather balloon. Again, we launch these weather balloons two times a day, every day. So this weather balloon begins collecting information. And so this is what some of that information looks like above the ground. Notice it looks a little bit different than that surface map. We're still collecting the same information. It's just delayed in a, displayed in a slightly different way. This is giving us our temperatures, our moisture, our wind to figure out where there could be potential storm systems. This is something that we look at to figure out, okay, is there an area of the country where there's disturbed weather that could move into our part of the country? So again, this is where all of this analysis comes into play. So our weather balloon keeps rising. It keeps collecting information. Um, if you're interested in looking at any of the information that I just showed, what the weather balloons collect, I'll give you a link at the end of this presentation that you can check out on your own. But the weather balloon keeps collecting information, keeps moving up and up, and eventually it moves so high, it gets so big that it pops, right? So now that we have an idea of what's happening now using all of the different weather tools that are available to us, we then plug it back into some very highly detailed, very powerful computer models. Now, these computer models are basically solving really complicated math equations that help describe what's happening in the atmosphere at many different levels. That's why we're looking at all the different levels is because we have a lot of equations that have to be run to, to give us that, that potential solution of what could happen. Now, on the right-hand side here, these are actual equations that meteorologists learn when they go to school to understand how the atmosphere works. There's not going to be a pop quiz on this at the end. Don't worry if this makes your head hurt. It makes everyone a little nervous the first time they see it. But these are the equations that we use to actually put together the weather forecast. Now, how do we use these equations? You've probably heard meteorologists refer to weather models, weather forecast models. These models are essentially a group of these really complicated equations, um, and they all use some kind of a starting point. And that starting point in, a, in an environment where we're actually forecasting the weather is the current weather. It's what's happening now. So what's happening now is our starting point. And that gets applied to these weather forecast models or these really complicated equations to simulate and predict what uh, the weather would be like in the future. So this image on the left here um, is a weather forecast model solution for how a hurricane might behave. And then this image on the right here, you see some numbers that kind of fade into a map. 
those numbers are actually a model guess at what uh, temperatures are going to be like, at what uh, cloud cover is going to be like, and all of that information factors into the forecast that a person would create, which is this image over here on the right. But it's not just meteorologists taking what's happening in the, the weather model and plugging it into the forecast. Because the, what the model puts out is just that one model's guess. The equations they're using are an approximation, which is basically a fancy way of saying they're close to, but they're not exact, uh, descriptions of what's going to happen in the atmosphere. So forecasters actually apply their own local experience um, to what's going to happen. So what I want you to do is I want you to watch this stoplight for a few moments and see if you can pick out what the pattern is in it. So what you're probably seeing is that the green light flashes a few times, and then the yellow light comes on, and then the red light, and then the lights move back down to green. And this is pretty much what forecasters do, is they're looking for patterns within the atmosphere. And when they see these certain patterns, it can give them more or less confidence in what solutions are that the weather models are giving them. So this pattern here that's on the left, if the meteorologist sees the atmosphere really high up above the ground looks like this, then it may give them more confidence that there could be thunderstorms or heavy rain or some kind of disturbed weather over South Texas. And how do you build up this pattern recognition? A lot of it comes from experience and just spending time forecasting for a certain area. So forecasters combine these current conditions. They take a look at the weather forecast models to see if what they're saying makes sense. And they apply their own local knowledge of how weather in an area behaves to then work on creating the weather forecast. And we have several tools that we use to create this. Uh, NOAA, which is the parent organization for the National Weather Service. It stands for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, but sometimes it seems like the National Organization for Advancing Acronyms because we really like acronyms here within the National Weather Service. But we have these really powerful supercomputers. Now, how powerful are these supercomputers? Well, they can perform 2.8 quadrillion and that's the number listed on the screen, calculations in one second. Now, I want you to think about how many math equations you can solve in a minute. And this 2.8 quadrillion, I know I can't solve anywhere close to, I, I'm impressed if I can solve five math equations in one minute. Um, but this is, this is a really big number. And it means that we've got some really powerful computers to help us put together those weather forecasts. Now, how do we actually put together that weather forecast? We've looked at our observations. We've looked at our forecast models that have been produced by these supercomputers. We actually use something within the National Weather Service called an Advanced Weather Information Processing System. Remember how I talked about those acronyms? It's also called AWIP. Now, this is a look at what a meteorologist workstation looks like in any National Weather Service office. We have a lot of screens. The screen on the right showing some satellite data, the middle screen showing some radar data, and then this left screen over here is showing the program that National Weather Service meteorologists use to create weather forecast. And if you've ever used Microsoft Paint, it's pretty similar to what that program is. You can actually draw in the forecast. You can load lots of different kinds of model data. Um, and you can actually bring in observations, forecasts from surrounding offices, uh, but you can look at lots of information to actually paint the forecast. Now, just to bring everything back together, meteorologists take a look at what's happening now, and they apply math and physics, and then they apply their own experience with some of the tools that we have, so those supercomputers, that AWIP system, how we put together what will happen, what the forecast will be for an area. Now, there's lots of different types of weather forecasts, and these are just some of the things that you may have seen. 
Um, river forecast, remember that river forecast center I was talking about. Um, thunderstorm risk, that is something that the Storm Prediction Center puts out. This graphic on the upper right-hand side is basically pulled straight from that paint program that we were talking about. Uh, but we also provide more specialized forecasts for wildfire potential. If you're a mariner, if you just like to go out on the water, we do provide marine forecasts. We provide forecasts for airport, outlooks. Lots of different types of forecasts are produced based on the, that basic information that we just went through. Now, if you're looking where you can find weather forecasts, uh, our weather is www.weather.gov slash Corpus Christi. And we'll always have some kind of an image on there if you're looking for a quick snapshot. If you scroll down on the page, you can actually click over your location to get a specific forecast for your area. Again, we're heading into hurricane season. So if you're curious about hurricanes, we also have a weather Wednesday talk that'll be over hurricanes. But if you're, you want to know more, you want to see hurricane forecast, www.hurricanes.gov. And then the Storm Prediction Center's webpage is www.spc.noaa.gov. And this is going to be the page to look at that weather balloon data that we talked about a few slides ago. All of that is available there. Now, if you've watched this and you thought, hey, maybe, you know, I really like this pattern recognition. I like being able to look at all these different sources of information. How do I become a meteorologist? Well, the biggest thing is liking math and science. We saw those equations earlier. That's what you're going to be doing in school. So having a, a real strong background in math, a real like, love uh, for math is really important. Uh, to work in the National Weather Service, you do need a college degree in meteorology, atmospheric science, or some other natural science that gives you weather experience. And the good news is several colleges around Texas now offer meteorology programs if you're interested um, in going and staying close to home. So we're about to wrap up our second Weather Ready Wednesday. Um, thank you all so much for uh, being a part of this. Our next Weather Ready Wednesday will be April 15th, again at 11 a.m. This will be on thunderstorms. Get lots of cool information there. If you have any questions, again, following this, uh, you can always email me. Our next webinar will be Wednesday at 11 a.m., and I look forward to, to hopefully seeing all of you on it again.